Good evening. My name is Charity Bryan. I teach here in the Department of Health Promotion and Physical Education. Thank you for attending the Grady Palmer Distinguished Lecture Series uh, lecture this evening. Uh, before we go any further, we have some significant thank yous to dole out for this evening and for the opportunity to have our esteemed speaker here. Uh, and Joan, was, whom I'm going to introduce in just a second, was kind enough to sign and autograph some books. So if I could, um, Casey White, this is one of our um, sponsors. That's me. Is it me? Oh, it's you. You can hear You do whatever you want. <laughs> Thank you uh, to Student Affairs for your sponsorship of, of having Joan with us on campus today. Candace Porter, our department head in uh, HPE, thank you so much for everything you've done to help us get Joan here. And a, uh, a very important three-time Tennessee grad who has all of his teeth and wears shoes. <laughs> Uh, our provost, Dr. Ken Harmon. So, Ken, thank you for being here tonight. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we're in a world of hurt. Uh, before I introduce our speaker for the evening, I'd like to thank also the family of Dr. Grady Palmer for their continued support of this important event. And I know uh, Grady's son is here, so welcome and thank you. We appreciate so much what your family does for this event. Dr. Grady Palmer was one of Kennesaw State's Uni State University's charter faculty members who served in the Department of Health, Physical Education, and Recreation when the university opened. He was a valued faculty member for 30 years before he retired in 1996. Dr. Palmer received his bachelor's and master's degrees from Middle Tennessee State University, and his, that's the right state, right, Joan? <laughs> and his doctorate from the University of Georgia in health education. He served as chair of the HPE department from 1980 to 1984. This evening, it's my honor to introduce to you Joan Cronin, Women's Athletic Director Emeritus from the University of Tennessee. This is a great day for KSU, and we're so glad to have Joan with us. From the time she was a young girl growing up in Opelousas, Louisiana, Joan has been an advocate for girls and women in sport. In fact, Joan's tr uh, career trajectory began at age 12 when she wasn't allowed to play Little League Baseball in Opelousas because of her gender. While that was indeed an unfortunate situation for Joan at the time, I believe thousands of young women have likely benefited from the fire that was born that day when Joan wasn't allowed to join the baseball team. Joan earned her bachelor's and master's degrees both in physical education from LSU. She was also a math major, so that's very <laughs> impressive. She was a fall 1995 inductee into LSU's Alumni Hall of Distinction and the 2014 commencement speaker at LSU's graduation. In her storied career at the University of Tennessee, Joan built one of the nation's most respected women's athletics programs. She served as women's athletic director from 1983 until 2012, and then served as the school's overall interim athletic director in 2011. Her accolades are many, and you can read the extensive list in your program. In addition to those, Tennessee has named its new volleyball practice, uh, practice facility after Joan. No doubt you're probably all aware of the legendary career of Pat Summit, who coached women's basketball at the University of Tennessee and was the winningest coach in NCAA basketball, men's or women's. Joan had the enviable task of serving as women's athletic director during Pat's tenure at Tennessee, where national championships were as common as singing Rocky Top. Joan has said, people would refer to me as her boss, and I always remarked, Pat Summit had no boss. On the morning that Pat Summit died from early onset dementia of the Alzheimer's type, Joan was reminded that before she left the house, she should go back inside and make her bed. I hope Joan will share that inspirational story with us this evening. I assure you, you're in for a treat, and after the lecture, I hope that you'll join us in the atrium to meet Joan and get an autographed copy of her new book, Sport is Life with the Volume Turned Up, Lessons Learned that Apply to Business and Life. 
ladies and gentlemen, a legendary hero in women's athletics and my friend. It is wonderful to be here, and I have had a wonderful time on your campus. When I volunteered, which all Tennesseans do, to come down and spend the day, I had no idea that I would start at 9 and finish at 9, and, uh, and all the fun times we've had. I've been to the business school and with development and lots of things, and everybody I have met has been absolutely wonderful. And somebody just leaned over to me right now and said, you know, Joan, the only thing between you, us, and Henry's to eat dinner tonight is you. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to have fun and a great time, and I'm excited to be here. I'm here because I believe in what we all do. I believe in physical education. I believe in athletics. I believe in women's athletics. I believe in men's athletics, too, because that's kind of fun. But I have spent my career talking about what a difference women's athletics can make in young women. I had the privilege of working with Pat Summit for over 30 years. And I always used to laugh, you know, that I was a pretty darn good AD as long as Pat was coaching basketball. So we, we felt like we made a really good partnership and our goals and our, everything was exactly lined up. And I am so thankful for that opportunity. I'm going to introduce Kim and our Blumenthal back here in the back. Raise, raise your hand. They're not sitting on the first three rows, which they should, but uh, they need to. But I want to tell you, just before I start, a little bit about what we're doing together. We have started the Pat Summit Leadership Group. And this group is designed to make Pat Summit's legacy even bigger than it is. And it's, that's not hard to do because it's, it's big. In fact, last week, Forbes listed the top 10 coaches ever. And guess who was number three? And guess who was the only female on the list? Pat Summit was. So what we're talking about is a real legacy. And I'm going to talk about some of the lessons that we learned, some of the things that we got to do. Uh, Charity mentioned that I got into this business at 12, really, because it made me mad that they would not let me play Little League Baseball, and it just wasn't fair. You know Barbara Mandrell's song that she was country before it was cool to be country? Well, I was a tomboy before it was cool for women to be in sports and to watch what has happened over the last decades the opportunities. I got a chance to speak to your women's basketball team tonight, this afternoon, and how excited they were that they were representing Kennesaw. I talked about what a privilege it was to have Kennesaw across their chest, and I expect them to win the game tonight because I was giving them their pregame talk. There was, <laughs> there was no, no excuses we, we had to do. So I'm going to, after we finish here, before I go to Henry's, I'm going to go watch a, a little bit of, of the basketball game. But I want to talk today, and I started with Pat, and I'll just go from there, about some of the lessons that I learned from Pat Summit. You know, when Pat died of Alzheimer's, she told me that when she was diagnosed with that disease, that she thought she was going to be remembered for winning basketball games. But now that she was diagnosed and was going to battle this disease, she hoped she was remembered for making a difference in that disease. And boy, did she work at that. And boy, has she made a difference. I said, Pat smiled at least two times in heaven this year. Once was when we opened the Pat Summit Clinic in Knoxville, Tennessee. And it's a state-of-the-art clinic which is designed to help with research. It's designed to help with caregivers and how they battle this disease. The second time, I have to admit, was when Mississippi State beat Connecticut last year. 
I knew that was a, that, that made her smile too. It was an SEC team and uh, you know, the Connecticut rivalry was really big and I agree that without Tennessee, they wouldn't be in a Connecticut and without Connecticut, they wouldn't be a Tennessee. And that's what I'm gonna talk tonight about is competition and how good it is and how it helps you to be successful. So Pat taught us courage as she faced this disease. The other thing, and, and Charity brought it up, was discipline and making your bed up. You know, as Pat got sicker through the disease, we had a game plan and we knew death was near and we all had a, a, a responsibility. And mine was um, to get to the nursing home and be sure that the media didn't get involved because this was about family and this was not about a media time. So I'll never forget that morning. It was 5 a.m. My phone rings and I wake up out of a dead sleep and it's Tyler, her son, and he said, Joan, mom just went to heaven. Well, you can imagine as I wake up out of a sleep and one of my best friends, one of my colleagues, and I'm trying to think, what was that I was supposed to do? You know, where's the numbers? Where are all of this? And as I focused this and tried to come in, I got dressed and I went running out of my bedroom and I looked back and my bed was unmade. Well, it was 5.30 in the morning, you know, but my bed was unmade. And as I looked, I said, I could just picture Pat in Thompson Bowling Arena at a basketball camp with a thousand little girls sitting on the floor. And the first thing she did every time we started a camp was she walked in and said, how many of you have made up your bed today? And a few little girls would raise their hand. And then she would explain to them what that was all about and why it was important, the discipline, and starting right and doing all these things. And the next day she would come in and a few more hands would go up. By Friday, when that booming voice walked in that gym and she said, how many of you made up your bed today? There were a thousand little hands going up. Guess what I did that morning? I went back and made up my bed. So that's one of the things that Pat taught us. Another thing is I think of the many times was the focus. You're not going to be good in life unless you can really focus on what you did. We called it the stare. She was famous for the stare. On Sports Illustrated, they, they had her eye, and to me it was a really ugly picture. I told the photographer, you spent all this time in Knoxville and I let you have access, and that's the picture you came up, but it showed her stare, and that was what she was famous. I thought about the stare as being focused rather than just a stare, because that's the way she was. She was so focused. In fact, one day, we were riding downtown Knoxville and there was a bank, tall bank building, First Tennessee, and it had been there about five or six years. And Pat said, look, Joan, there's a new bank. I said, Pat, it's been there forever. You've just been focusing on the basketball court. And that's what she did, and that's why she was good at what she did. She focused. The other thing Pat Summit taught us was humility. When she died and we had a celebration of life, about 98% of the athletes that she had coached came back for the celebration. And as we gathered, I called a team meeting and I got us all in a huddle and I told them what an impact Pat had had on their lives and my life. I told them we probably would not meet in our whole career anybody who was more influential and had, had more accolades than Pat Summit. But I said the important thing for you to remember is the and. Not only had she had these accolades, and she was the most humble person you will ever meet. And I think that's important as you go through life, that you don't get how important you are, that you remember to be humble, and Pat was. Now I have to admit, after we won a few championships and a lot of great things were happening, sometimes we had to tease her a little bit. And I remember the night after the weekend, after we had won a national title. We were down in Florida celebrating. Got a real, Nick's, if any of you know anything about the Destinary. 
we're sitting at a restaurant and there's a table here and we're sitting at this table. Well, this table keeps staring at us. And so Mickey DeMoss, who is our assistant, who's always the jokester of the group, kept punching Pat and saying, they recognize you. Why don't you go over and visit with them? Pat would say, oh no, oh no. Well, this goes on throughout the evening. Well, sure enough, towards the end of the evening, Pat gets up and goes to visit with the table next to us who's been staring at us all night. And she goes up to a lady and she says, you know, y'all, and the lady says, I know we have been staring at you and we're so sorry. We're trying to figure out who you are. We know we know you, but we can't quite figure it out. And Pat starts to say something and then the lady says, oh, but we got it. We know. You work at Ace Hardware, don't you? <laughs> And it was so funny. So any time after that, when we did something important, we would say, you work at Ace Hardware, don't you? <laughs> so you, but she was so humble. The other thing that I remember about some of the things that Pat taught us was obviously her leadership skills and what a great leader she was. But we, she and I both had a similar fault in that we like to leave late and arrive early. Well, I hate to admit it, especially the students in this room, but the only way you're going to do that is speed, right? And so sometimes we had to do that to do leave late and arrive early. Well, Pat never, when we happened to get stopped, tried to talk her way out of the ticket or was never anything but respectful. But before we left the office, she always wanted to drive and she always wanted to put her purse in the trunk before we started. I said, okay. And she always wanted to drive because she thought she could drive faster than me. I didn't think so, but she could. <laughs> and so if by chance somebody stopped to visit with us along the way, Pat was always polite and she would be very positive. And then she would say, oh, I need to get my purse out of the trunk. And she was planning ahead. She would go back, open her trunk, and not only did she have her purse in the trunk, but she always had an autographed basketball. <laughs> Guess what, folks? We never got a ticket. We never got a ticket, and I think every state trooper knows about Pat. I have up here what we call the definite dozen, and I'm going to quickly go through and give you some examples that I think are important. These are things that we tried to teach our athletes, and we feel like we accomplished them, but I want to share them with you. The first one is respect. Listen to this. The people who know you the best should respect you the most. Now think about that. The people who know you the best should respect you the most. That means, you know, I could walk in a room and just wow y'all and walk out and go home and my kids don't like me at all because I'm the meanest mom in the world. <laughs> so you need to work on family and friends first. The people who know you the best should respect you the most. Number two, responsibility. You're never going to be a good team. We're a team at Kennesaw University. The basketball team's over there getting ready to play. They're not going to be any good unless they know who's responsible for what and I'm going to let, lend accountable in there also. I think you've got to be responsible and accountable, and you have to be able to know what you are responsible for. That's why I love sports. Think about a coach who calls a timeout, and the team comes over. They have, say it's Coach Summon, and if I was dribbling down the floor and dribbled the ball off my foot, and Pat called timeout. I'm not sure I would have wanted to go to the huddle, but they did because they respected her so much. She had 30 seconds to tell people what you did right, what you did wrong, what we need to change, and who's responsible for what. So if you're going to be successful, you have to know responsibility. Number three, loyalty. We all have to be good Girl Scouts and good Boy Scouts. You've got to be loyal to the people around you. I love it when I see players 
raise their jersey and they say, I'm playing for Tennessee, or I'm playing for Kennesaw, or Jennifer, I'm playing for Auburn. I, heaven forbid. But, uh, <laughs> but you have to be loyal to your team. Communication. We've all gone to 100 communication seminars. There are two things that I want you to think about. One is learn to say thank you. So many times somebody does something really good for us and we say thank you. But then so many times today, think of how many people did something, how many of your staff people did something for you in the physical education department? A lot. So learn to say thank you as you go through. That's so important. The other thing with communication is one of my pet peeves is bad body language. How many of you have somebody that you work with when you see them coming? You want to run. They could have the best news in the world. They could be coming to tell you you have a lottery, won the lottery. But unless they can greet you with a smile, with their shoulders back, you're not going to be successful. Next is discipline. Boy, this one's important. I want you to think about this. All of us know when we're messing up. And it's important that you learn to discipline yourself before someone else has to. We all know when we're slipping and that mind talk goes to us. And that's the time you want to step in before your professor has to say, where's that paper that was due two days ago? You knew it was due. Discipline yourself before someone else has to. Hard work, the only place that success comes before work is in the dictionary. Think about that. The only place that success comes before work is in the dictionary. Work smart. Use anything you can do to make use of your time wisely. In my book, my grandkids listed 70 things that they loved about Grandy. That's the most important part of the book to me because I love my grandchildren. But one of the things they say is, Grandy gets every new gadget that comes out. But what they meant is I love to be tech savvy and I'm going to do anything I can do to be better. So work smart. Team, I can remember so many times we'd win a national championship and we won eight of them. And we'd win a national championship and one of Pat's first remarks was, you know, I've won three, four, five, whatever number it was of championships, but I never scored a goal. It was about the players. So give credit to your team and make sure they're on your team together. Attitude, a person who says they can and a person who says they can't are both right. A person who says they can and a person who says they can't are both right. Now I put this one in the bottom corner, not that I think it's not important because if I had to say, if you came up to me, if ESPN came up today and said, what is the most important ingredient to somebody being successful? My answer would be, they need to be competitive. You can talk about all those things, but to win, and to be a part of something that's successful, you've got to be competitive. Now, I challenge you not to go home and say, we had this crazy speaker that spoke to us, and she said, if we weren't athletic, we weren't going to be successful. That's not what I said. I said you had to be competitive. Now, obviously, I think athletics is a great tool to do that. But... I think it's important. You can be competitive in dance and speech and any of that, but just know that you've got to want to be the best that you can be. I want you to think a minute of who is your biggest competitor. If I owned Burger King, it would be McDonald's. I said this morning as I walked by Chick-fil-A in the student center, I'm not sure Chick-fil-A has a competitor, <laughs> but McDonald's and Burger King I would say, as athletic director at the University of Tennessee, 
Our biggest competitors would be Auburn and Alabama and Florida. So think about who your biggest competitor is. This is called, I thank my competitors. My competitors do more for me than my friends. My friends are too polite to point out my weaknesses, but my competitors go to great expense to tell me of them. My competitors are efficient and diligent. They make me search for ways to improve my products. My competitors would take my business away from me if they could. This keeps me alert to hold on to what I have. If I had no competitors, I would be lazy, incompetent, and complacent. I need the discipline they enforce upon me. God bless my competitors. They've been good to me. Isn't that true? As an athletic director, I can't tell you how many times I would be sitting at my desk and a coach would come in and you know coaches like everything right now and they would say, Joan, I need this. I have to have this. And I would say, why? And the next words out of their mouth was, Georgia has it or Alabama has it. Competition is good. Don't be afraid to be competitive. Don't be afraid to know that you need to, to do that. I've said many times there wouldn't have been a Connecticut without a Tennessee. There wouldn't have been a Tennessee without a Connecticut. That competition raised women's athletics to a different, different level. Okay, change. It's inevitable. Just accept it and make it the best you can do because life changes. You change, people change, and if you're not changing, you're going backwards. So don't, don't worry about that one. This one, handle success the way you handle failure. If you were listening to all of our coaches' shows on Sunday morning, no matter which school it is, and they're talking, you hear them talk about, especially those that lost, they're going to learn from their losses. That's good. But I want them to learn from their wins also. Whenever you get an A on your paper and you're thrilled, take a minute to think about, why did I get an A? I started early, I did the right research, and that's going to help you as much as if you'd got a D on your paper. Be thinking about what it takes to be successful, and I guarantee you, you're going to be better off. Heard a speaker one day say that women needed three C's in their life. Well, that's, I said, okay, let me see what it does. It applies to the guys, too, so it's just funnier when I talk about it for women. And the speaker said that birth to 18, that we needed lots of compliments. Well, I've had a teenagers, and you pat them on the back, and you encourage them. The speaker went on to say from 18 to 30 that we needed lots of confidence because we're making career decisions. We're making, deciding what we're going to do for the rest of our life, probably. Then the speaker said that after 30, what women needed, the third C that they needed, was cash. <laughs> and I said, cash, check, credit card. You know, we'll accept them all. That, that, that's really fun. But I really think there's three C's, and I've talked about two of them. I've talked about competition, and I've talked about communication. The third C, and I hope this is why you're here tonight, where you can gain some more confidence in what you're doing. You're not going to be successful unless you're confident in yourself. To me, there are two ways to gain confidence. One is learn as much as you can about what you're doing. And then number two, have a mentor or a coach who's going to help you along the way. Learn as much as you can and have a mentor or a coach. We had a ball player several years ago. Her name was Dina Head. Dina was from Michigan. She was a point guard. She was an All-American. Great player, great kid. Her junior year, we're playing in Thompson Bowling Arena. We're playing Louisiana Tech. Louisiana Tech's ranked number one in the country we're ranked number two. 16,000 people are there 
to watch this game. It was amazing. Great ball game, really close, nip and tuck. Right at the end of the ball game, with about three seconds to go on the clock, Dina got fouled, and Louisiana Tech is up by one point, which meant Dina was going to the free throw line. She makes one, we tie the ball game. She makes two, we win. That night, in front of 16,000 people, Dina went to the free throw line and missed her free throw. La Tech went back to Ruston, ranked number one. We stayed in Knoxville, ranked number two. I cannot tell you how many times that spring I saw Dina in our arena shooting free throws. What was she doing? She was working on that body of knowledge. Well, the next year, senior, Dina's senior year, we're playing in the national championship game. We happened to be playing Virginia that year. They had a point guard, and if you follow women's basketball, her name was Dawn Staley, and Dawn has gone and obviously done a great job at South Carolina in coaching. Well, it was a great game, but Virginia got up early. They were up by seven points at the quarter, at halftime, at the three-quarter mark. Gang, they were up by seven points with three minutes to go. Well, if you don't know anything about me after tonight, I want you to know that I like to win. And about that time, we're down by seven points with three minutes to go. I'm beginning to pace. We're better than they are. We're going to win. What can we do? All of a sudden, we get a steal and make a layup. We get the ball back and make a three-point shot. We're down by two. Guess what happened? Dina got fouled. You are exactly right. Well, this time, she was going to the free throw line and had to make both free throws to tie the ball game and put us into overtime. What did Virginia's coach do? Come on, coaches, you got some timeouts. You're right, young man. She called timeout to give us time to think about Dina's got to make these free throws. As they came off the floor, I thought, I wonder what Pat's going to talk to these young ladies about during the entire timeout. Now, remember confidence, body of knowledge. Dina had really been working, but you need a coach or a mentor to believe in you. Well, when they came off the floor, and Pat talked to the young ladies during the entire time out. She talked to them about what they were going to do after Dina made the free throw. So what was she saying? Dina, I believe in you, and you're going to make those free throws. Well, if you were on the inside and you were watching the bench, you watched Dina's shoulders go back. She's ready. She's the first one off the bench. Now, Pat was smart enough to know it's nice to have confidence, but a game plan helps too. So she grabbed her two forwards and she said, now if she misses, this is what you do. We're prepared. Dina went out, made both free throws. We went into overtime and won a national championship. So think about confidence, that you've got to work at what you're doing and you have to have somebody to help you. Also think about, I can't do anything by myself. I need people to help me. Candace Parker is the name most of you will know. Candace was one of our best players ever. She helped us win national championships. She's won gold medals. She's been the MVP in the WNBA. But I will never forget recruiting Candace. Obviously, Pat wanted her. She was the best player in the country. And we were all intense talking about what we needed to do. So when I visited with Candace. It was before a women's game. She was a senior in high school. So I was asking her about, you know, what schools are you going to, why do you want to attend Tennessee? What do you like about us? And I, uh, goodbye Tennessee graduate, three-time UT graduate walking out the door. We got, good, that's, a, you excused absence. <laughs> uh -huh. So we wanted Candace to come. So I said, why would you might come to Tennessee? You know, I thought she might say a great university. I thought she might say great facilities. Thought she would sure say a great coaching staff. I hope she would say a great athletic director. But you know what she said? She said, I'm coming to Tennessee 
because where else in America would they be fans outside a women's basketball game scalping tickets? <laughs> we got Candace not because all of what we did, we got it because we had great, great fans, and that's important. In closing, I want to tell you one more story about setting goals and how important it is and how important it is to state your goals and let people know what your goals are and how important it is if you're going to walk the walk and talk the talk that you really do it. So many times, and if Pat was standing right here, she would tell you that yes, we won a lot of games, yes, we won a lot of championships, but the thing that she was proudest of was that every young lady who played for her for four years, and this is over almost four decades, graduated. So we were preaching student athletes, and that was important to us. Well, we were recruiting a young lady. She's out of Kentucky, came from a very, very poor family, a poor academic situation. And Pat called me on the way back after visiting with this young lady. You know, in our world, we can go into their home and visit, and then we can bring them in on campus. So she went up to visit with this young lady, and on the way back, she called me. She said, Joan, I don't know if she can fit in. I don't know if she can make this big a adjustment. Well, the AD in me said, how good is she? And she said, she's really good. And I said, and she said, and she really wants to come. So I said, well, let's bring her into campus and see how we all respond to her and how she responds to us. Well, we brought her in one Saturday. It was a Saturday morning that 107,000 people were running around our campus dressed in orange. <laughs> it was a pretty exciting day. It was a football Saturday. And I'll never forget walking to my office and this tall, attractive, blonde young lady is standing there waiting to visit with me. And she has the most expensive looking suit that I'd ever seen. Well, you can imagine my mind talk. I'm picturing poverty and bad, bad situation. And here's this model in a beautiful suit sitting. So I visited with her and finally I said, you know, that's one of the prettiest suits I've ever seen. And she looked at me and she smiled and she said, you know, when Coach Summit came in to visit, my mother drew a picture of the suit that she had on. And my mother made this suit for me to come visit. Well, gang, I'm soft-hearted. That kid was signed. You know, we, we had already made a difference. We had already made a difference. Well, she came in, and she wasn't the star, but she was a blue-collar worker. She made things happen. The middle of her junior year, and she did well academically. The middle of her junior year, our academic advisor came in and said, Joan, she's struggling academically. It's not that she's not trying. She's on that treadmill, and she just can't catch up. I'm some of you sure your students understand that. There's just not enough time in the world to catch up. So I called a summit conference. I called Pat and this young lady and our academic advisor. And we talked about being a student athlete and how important that was. We wanted to walk our talk. So what we decided was to pull her out of practice for three weeks and off the road for three weeks. But to sure we went, weren't punishing her, we let her start at all the home games. So it was like tough love. We gave her that lollipop and said, you can do it. We want to help you. Well, after two weeks, our academic advisor came in and said, thumbs up. She's doing really, really well. So she started traveling and practicing and playing. We went to the SEC tournament and we lost in the finals. But she made the all-SEC uh, all team. And I was so pleased that we hadn't denied her an opportunity to be the best that she could be. We go into the Final Four, and it's Friday, and it's the day of the semifinal game, and I'm running around trying to be sure everybody has their tickets, the president's planes landed, the cheerleaders are there, the alumni are having the reception, all of those things, and I run back to my room to change clothes, and my phone rings. And it's this young lady. And she says, crying. And it scared me. I said, what's wrong? And she said, I wanted you to be the first one to know that I made the dean's list. 
She made the dean's list. She went on to help us win a national championship. But more important, that next year, she became the first member of her family ever to graduate from college. So if you don't remember anything else I've said tonight, remember it's important to set goals. It's important to walk your walk. And I'm a tennis nut. And I want you to think about this. In life and in tennis, it is better to serve than receive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, we are so appreciative of Joan uh, spending her day with us here at KSU. And uh, Joan, we have a little something for you. And um, for our audience, we have a little bit of time for Q&A uh, before we go outside. If you would uh, like Great. to go up. Joan, thank you so much mm -hmm. for. I want to know, how did y'all like the Joan phone when this is your life yes. show? I didn't want to turn around because I didn't want to see it. But look at this Reagan picture right here. That was at the White House, and we got to obviously visit with the president. And I will never forget, we went to the White House and took that picture. And I leave and I go to Nashville, and the president of the university is the gentleman on my left there. And uh, he called me, and the hotel called me, and there, there's they were, they said, Joan, Joan, it's the president of the university. I said, okay. And I got on the phone and he was laughing. And he said, Joan, just remember, it's not what you know, it's all in position. We were standing in the right position with the president there. So we got it on the front page of the Tennessean. But again, Kennesaw has been wonderful. Thank you guys. Thank you, Joan. has questions for Joan and then of course we'll continue our snacks outside as well as our book signing so uh, please feel free to ask away and pick this amazing brain. Okay you have the prettiest smile. Thank you. I'm Alicia Fillmore. I actually don't go to Kennesaw State. I'm actually down 75 at Clayton State as a graduate assistant. Okay um, very but, good. But as someone who aspires to be an athletic director one day um, just being able to see what she's done with program I just would love to know how that transition was outside of going from an AD now you know starting the, uh, the foundation for Pat Summit and we're doing the leadership yeah. group too yeah. you know I um, I have loved the transition I love my job and I still work with the university I help them raise money I'm on the law school advisory board but this is so much fun because I still we all want to make a difference and I'm able to get out and help that way but the I can't tell you how few people in their lives enjoy the journey. I get asked a lot after they ask me, what did Pat teach you? They asked me, what did you teach Pat? And she was so focused and so serious. I hope I taught her to enjoy the journey. And I'm enjoying the journey. Good question. Yes, Ira. Yeah, you know, all of us in management or in coaching have dealt with lots of that, average players. Talk about managing or directing a thoroughbred, because obviously Pat was a special, I wouldn't say breed of cat, but I'll say breed of ball. Absolutely, that's a, that's, a, that's a good term. You know, of, in our world, we talk about managing power coaches, because that's what athletic directors do. You know, I, I said all the time, if we're gonna be successful, we have to have great coaches. You have to surround yourself with great people. Pat was one of the easiest persons to manage because of who she was. I mean, she would come in and ask the smallest detail, what do you think about this? And I think it was partly because we had great respect for each other and our goals were the same. So I would say if you're managing people, be sure you get to know them and what their goals are. I looked at my job as an athletic director to make the coach's job the best it could be to make the student athletes experience the best it would be because that's what we really want. So our, I've managed some tough coaches, but Pat was a wonderful coach to manage. Good question. Anything else? I've, I've read okay. that um, uh, Pat used to drive the team bus. Yes. <laughs> when you got to Tennessee, was 
No, I, 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 got a, I got a ride of the team bus when I got there. But is, that, is that where the program kind of was when you got there? Yeah, absolutely. I, I will tell you, and we look at the financing of the world of athletics now, when I got to Tennessee, and it, it wasn't just me that made the change, but it was a lot of things. Pat's assistant was making $12,000, and Pat was not making more than double that. It was between 18 and 20, and I said, to me, the most valuable quantity any business has it's its people and we've got to treat our people right and that was my philosophy questions no, I think I, I, how from a former about, coach here that's right. how do you feel about the money and it, the effect of the few salaries that coaches make is, is I wish I was coaching football at Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think, I personally think we've let the salaries get a little bit too high for what we're doing, and that's where we have the problem with the players wanting to be paid. You know, I, I think that my goal is to have our athletes get a great education, have a, lay, a foundation for life, get great coaching, great insurance, all of those type of things. But I think, you, I think we'll see that change some, just like the stock market adjusts a little bit. I think one day that will. But there's certain coaches that need to be paid that salary because their market value is that good. I mean, and I felt that way about Pat. My job was her market value was so much better than anybody else coaching women's basketball and most of the men. And so I spent a lot of time being sure that we were fair for her because she wanted to stay at Tennessee and I didn't want to give her any reason to leave. Other questions? You guys have been great. I have loved to stay on campus. I have a book that if any of you would like to buy one and I'll be glad to autograph it for you. It's called Sport is Life with the volume turned up. It's lessons you learn and some of the stories that I shared with you are in there. But uh, again, this is a special place. I have watched Kennesaw grow by going down the interstate and watching every time I come to Atlanta. It's been wonderful. I had the privilege of knowing your, one of your previous pre presidents in Betty Siegel. And to me, she was one of the most dynamic women I've ever met. We got a chance to go to the Renaissance weekend many times in Hilton Head and she just wowed me. And I just, so to be back here today and the fact that she's battling Alzheimer's also, to hear two great women We've got to find a cure, and I think we will. Thank you all so much.